because you're jumping back into the gut. Oh, let's hey, go. Coach. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. I appreciate you joining us for this week's podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit basketballimmersion.com for more coaching resources and access to all the basketball podcasts. I hope you will give us a shout out on social media on Twitter at Bball Immersion or on Instagram at Basketball Immersion to help me continue to share the game. Enjoy the episode. Coach is super excited today to have Dean Vickerman with us. Coach is the head coach at Melbourne United of the NBL, the National Basketball League in Australia. As head coach, Coach Vickerman is a two times NBL champion, uh, first as head coach of the New Zealand Breakers. And second is the head coach of Melbourne United, and uh, he also uh, won two championships as an assistant coach as well. Coach, uh, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, w- wonderful to be able to have you on, and uh, you know, tremendous basketball being played in the NBL, and uh, I know you're waiting to get your season started. So uh, let's talk some basketball. And uh, one thing I wanted to start with, which is uh, something that somebody noted as I prepared for this podcast, and that was that uh, you said this, I guess, a few times in clinics, and that's to start practice with something that makes your team talk. Can you talk to about that? Yeah, and I think that, you know, obviously there's theme – to the, your day at practice and being a program that likes to get our defensive drills in early, you know, we look at, you know, what are the things that are going to make a, a practice effective when we do start with those defensive drills and, you know, using your voice is, is certainly a major contributor to a good defensive practice. Uh, we look at the stance and, and your footwork and, and try and hit some of those little drills as well. But I think you can get a sense at the start of practice about, you know, what kind of mood people are in and whether they're really upbeat and and you need that kind of drill or, or, you know, it's something that it's a a major focus for, for that session is to, to really build the talk early. And we've got some great talkers on our team and picking up Jack White out of Duke. He's, he's been such a, a brush of fresh air for, for some of the veterans where they've felt they've carried the voice and the load of the talk at different times. You know, to have that guy come in and, and, and just be energetic about it and enjoy his voice being heard has been a lot of fun. It's very cool to hear that, especially in relation to helping you decide how you've got to be sort of as a coach during that practice. But can you give us some examples of some of the drills that you would do then to be able to get them engaged in talking? Yeah, I think any time we need that component, we've just got a, like a bit of a four-corner passing drill. That's something you know, and, and the balls are just coming quick and fast and, and the movement, the change of movement on a saw to go other direction or the change of types of pass that you need to be able to throw. And and, and just, it needs everybody uh, communicating, certainly on a change of direction where you've got four balls and a passing drill and everybody's moving. So, you know, at least you're going to have eight people, you know, communicating on a change in direction of a passing drill each time. So, you know, that's just one that we've used at different times. Yeah, it's great. And uh, the, the connection, obviously, to communication is not just communicating, but purposeful communication. And I know you you consider yourself a little bit of a defensive coach in terms of your mindset of how you approach things. Can you talk about then how you connect that communication to make sure it's just, it's not just talk, right? There's purpose to it. Yeah, and I think, you know, in... in in the game, the clarity of, you know, the communication and I think we spend a lot of time on just trying to look at every word um, that you use in your system to defend a, a ball screen. And, and I think we'll try to get the, the clarity. Can it just be one word, you know, every time? Can it be repeated early and late and clear? And we just want, yeah, that's the clarity that we're, we're trying to seek in game. That, that one word can mean give you so much information, uh, but give you the absolute clarity of, of what you need to do in the game. Well, that's great. And I know it's one of the questions that I get asked a lot, and that's how do you get your team to talk? And, and I've got to think one of the most important parts of that, which I'm, I'm guessing you do, is that you have to be quiet as a coach. Yeah, there's, there's moments as a leader that you absolutely have to step back. You know, some days you've got to drive yourself if you – you, you really believe that that's going to help the, the practice the most. And hopefully that becomes infectious that later in the session, bet off a little bit. 
But yeah, there are days where certainly our, you know, our captain, Chris Goulding, who is a, a major voice in our practice, kind of come up to me before practice. He's like, you know, coach, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quiet today. I want to I see everybody else's voice rise up, which is great. You know, that's a development and a leadership development that others need. But we've never seen that day go so well. <laughs> it's, it's, it's much better when, when he's driving. And so, you know, we try it and we talk about it. And it's like, uh, you know, this is what just happened today. Your captain was quiet because he wanted everybody else to, to, to step forward. And so I think taking that backward step as a coach, and I think we do it, we, we're doing a better job of it in our program to even our assistant coaches to say, don't step into that huddle right now you know, let the players make those decisions, be around the huddle, but let, let them absolutely lead it. At times we'll, if we're in a scrimmage, I'll just grab a player from each team, bring them over to me, give information, let them go back and feed that information to the rest of the group. And again, you know, the assistant coaches are just around the huddle to make sure that they can analyze it afterwards and and maybe add some improvements to it. But you've got to challenge yourself with how you advance your leadership. And a big part of that leadership is, is how players communicate with each other. Well, that's awesome. I'm glad you connected that to the players as well, because certainly on your team, you usually have a few players that speak more than others naturally. So to get them to be quiet, to help other players rise up in their communication, such an awesome point. And we're going to talk about a topic that you covered a little bit and a shout out to your assistant, Justin Schuler, who did a great job with this. And I encourage coaches to go check it out, a part of your United clinics during the pandemic, but how coaches impact the game in real time. And this communication builds into starting practice because another thing I saw on your Twitter account and something that I saw when I I didn't get a chance to watch you guys play when I was or practice when I was in Australia, but I got a chance to watch some of the other NBL teams practice. And I saw this is that at the beginning of practice, you're not afraid to change it up and do some things that are different, right? You talked about boxing, yoga, futsal. I thought you said wrestling too in your Twitter. Can you talk about that in terms of some different things like that, that change it up to be able to help bring energy? Yeah, I think the you know the wrestling component came in my first year in back in Melbourne, and you know we we lacked the physicality. We uh, were really talented, but we would kind of one lose one, and, and and there was a big rebounding component to it. So we thought we'd try something different in a in a fever window where we had a chance to try a different element and to see what kind of response we got. And yeah, wrestling was the the one that we came up with just to players to em- embrace the physicality, to get down on the ground and not tap out. You know, you, you, there's no tap out in those wrestling. It was con- it was continuous and you had to find a way out. So that's what we got out of the wrestling component. I love boxing. It's a sport that I just see with the balance and the, and the movements that you make both offensively and defensively, the forward and back movement and um, the, and the hands and being able to be really sharp, you know, with your hands to to dig and move and in that kind of movement. And then we're and we're a soccer team, you know. We we I love my dad was wouldn't let me play AFL footy. He said you've got to go play soccer for it for a year, and you know get your footwork right. If you can dribble a a ball with your feet, you know you're going to be able to do you know most sports really well. And that kind of stuck with me. And so we have, we've had Soccer Friday for the last three years. We've moved our schedule in COVID this year to have an individual day on the Friday. So we're, we're Soccer Saturday at the moment. And so we play a, a six minute soccer game, just some cones as the goals. And now and again, we'll roll in some, some official goals, but our players are getting better at it. And, and, and it's competitive, got a component of, of win and loss to it. And whoever wins soccer gets to start with the ball in the first competitive five on five element for the day. So it's also, you know, start to practice that way. I love it. I love it. And even when I was saying wrestling, I didn't think that you actually meant they're actually wrestling. Like it's one on one wrestling. Do you have mats and stuff too, or is it just on the court? It was, it was a little scary. And, and I don't, <laughs> yeah. but in New Zealand, with a wrestling coach and and we did it on the court and I think we had one minor injury in that one and this time 
the, the first session that we did, we we went to the wrestling studio and it was all padded and you know, and that one was that one was pretty full on and yeah there was there was throws and and really aggressive holds and you know we had no injuries that day but it was it was on the borderline it was right on the edge of you know should is it, are we crazy or are we going to get good value out of this Great. And you mentioned the AFL and, uh, you know, coaches in North America would would uh, garner some different ideas from other sports like pro football and baseball and stuff. And in Australia, a lot of the influence is the AFL and uh, rugby. Can you talk about the influences of those two sports on you as a basketball coach? Yeah, the AFL is, uh, you know, firstly, the it's the NBA of, you know, our part of the world in in the budgets that they have in the, in the sports science that they use in you know the tracking and the monitoring of players um you know they're absolute leaders and a lot of afl players uh, afl staff have moved into you know the nba in in those types of areas as well because they're world leaders um the component of um their practice or their game is the one-on-one contests you know a, a ball's being kicked from 60 meters and you have to position yourself uh, to try and take a mark in a pack of people. Um, how does that relate? You, you can relate it to the way that you post up, the way that you maneuver both offensively and defensively in that one-on-one contest, but also within a crowd, um, you know, to, to get the basketball. I'll get the footy in that regard. Um, then I think the movement patterns, you know, certainly AFL coaches have come to us in basketball and and looked at our ball movement because their game has got so much faster. Um, you know, we talk about you know point five to make a, a decision with the with the basketball. You know, they're exactly the same right now. They're picking the ball up in a crowd of people who are about to tackle them, and they have to have you know really great spatial awareness of where they are, where the other players are, how quick they can they can move the footy uh, to the next guy, and then how they're system of offense runs and are they coming down the side of the football field? Are they coming down the middle? Um, are they into shorter passes or, or longer passes? And yeah, there's a lot of things that, uh, and the way that the game has just got faster that relates um, to how you, how you move the ball. Yeah, it's very cool to hear that and that connection. And I saw it when I was there too, just to, as you've mentioned, the resources, which is which is really impressive. Uh, the other part that I've heard you talk about is the, the share, which you call a trademark. Can you explain what that is first and then why a trademark is important as a coach? Mostly come through the AFL system where, you know, there, were, there was a group called Leading Teams that, you know, worked for a lot of um, the AFL teams at a time in a in a management consultant role or a team consultant role. And um, it was, again, like any team, you, you're trying to create a buy-in early on about the identity of your team. And so they set out a process that was uh, with a facilitator that really drove the teams to talk about what are the values that are most important uh, to this team to win and, and to be successful. And, you know, very similar words come up with, you know, the teams that I've been with, always a little bit different. And can you, out of those values, create an acronym that is meaningful and that is going to be used and is going to be lived? And I think in New Zealand, an acronym was, was CHER. In Melbourne, it's SHARE. And, you know, the words of relentless um, execution selflessness, hard, and and all those words, and I'm not going to just kind of spell it out exactly what ours is, um, but can you live those? Can you evaluate your game? Can you evaluate your practice? And when we just pick three at different times of our practices, we've changed up our evaluation at the moment, but did you have physicality in practice? Did you make someone else better? And did you execute? You know, that's a simple three-tick method that players will have a conversation with each other, evaluate another person or evaluate themselves after practice. And then it's kind of getting to the point that you're starting to live, you know, the trademark daily if you can, if you can get these ticks. So this helps guide the practice debrief 
And the practice debrief, if I understand, is player-led? Yeah, absolutely. As a coach, we'll have different days and just um, ask leading questions about you know, the performance of their, of their team on the day. But yeah, this is one that uh, we, we've used over the past couple of years. And we've certainly changed it up uh, this year as well to, to go to our, you know, what was the best thing that a player did related to our trademark? Um, and what's the one thing that they need to continue to get better at? And so they're getting that positive and they're also getting that reinforcement to say, you know, this is an area that we think if you improve is, is really going to help our team. Support for the basketball podcast comes from Bet Online. Football is in full effect and the NBA is back. You might not be at a game this year, but you can still be in on the action at Bet Online. Bet Online is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on everything imaginable this season. From game spreads and totals to team, player, and coach props, Bet Online gives you more options to wager than any place online. Head to Bet Online today and use promo code ARMCHAIR to take advantage of all the great sign up bonuses. Bet Online, your online sports experts use promo code ARMCHAIR, all in capitals. Now back to the podcast. And every practice has a debrief like this. And do you do something similar for games? Yeah, definitely post game. The next day, I'm, I'm not a coach that talks to his team directly after the game. I, I like to allow them to the space to enjoy it after a win or to, to how they um, come together after a loss. But, um, you know, we're pretty analytical like that to say, let's look at the tape, let's go back, let's review it, let's take the emotion out of um, the game and, and just get to the points that are important. But, you know, you know, we'll often or um, most of the time have a share line within our review to say, you know, these were some of the things that sat within the trademark that were outstanding that contributed to the win, or these are something that's outside of our trademark and, and something that we, we, we've got to get rid of or see less of. I love, I love this because it gives it structure uh, that, that is consistent, right? It's consistent messaging, but consistent structure to be able to evaluate as well. Absolutely. Coach, getting into a, a little bit more than of this, this culture piece, which again, another quote that I've heard you say, which I absolutely love, and I want you to explain it to our audience is culture is something that is value-based, but behavior led. Can you explain that? Yeah, and the values of your of your trademark have to be lived for for your culture to be strong. And so now that now that becomes the behaviour. And so I guess what you're trying to achieve um, to say our first one is is selfless. What what are what are the behaviours that uh, allow you to be um, a selfless athlete and we have to highlight them or, you know, highlight the negative if, if we're not doing those. And that's both on court and that's off court. And, you know, we had a player who was just a training player join our program and he stood out the front of um, stadium and had face masks because he knew it was one of the first days that we had to wear face masks into the venue just to get in. He brought a bunch of them and he stood out the front and he handed them out to people that he knew would possibly forget. And you've you got to highlight that to say, wow, that's a, you know, that allowed you to play basketball today just by someone, um, you know, thinking outside of themselves, thinking about, you know, how they could, how they could allow everybody else in the gym to play. And I think when you have those kind of moments off court, um, you know, we just got to highlight them as as a guy that wasn't even a contracted guy within our practice. Same the other way, you know, is is someone being selfish, um, you know, on an airplane and in, in just bringing himself a little bit of food and not offering someone else or doing different things like that. And so, um, you know, all those things build to really strong conversations. And I think that's where share and a trademark is you're trying to get to. You're trying to make the really tough conversations uh, much easier and for everybody to feel like they can hold someone else accountable, you know, if they're holding themselves accountable to the trademark. 
Well, I imagine that example and many like that are the ones where you start to realize as a coach that your players are are taking this beyond just your messaging and they're applying it. And that's really what this quote is about, right? The application of it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and you know, you want to you want to build great people, and I think this is you know certainly the method that we use to um, to have a value based program that you know if you live it, um, you know, some good things are going to happen to you. Whether that's you know you pick up a job afterwards because of the recommendations of the program about how well you um, conducted yourself while you were there. It's great stuff. And uh, as we get into kind of diving into the moments of a coach's influence, uh, I want to focus mainly on game day, if that's okay, and maybe start to go through some of these different areas on game day and then get your philosophy on that and uh, how, as we said, coaches impact the game in real time. So maybe can we start with pregame? Can we start with the pregame talk, the pregame presentation uh, in terms of what your philosophy is in terms of those things? Yeah, for me it was a game. We'll, we'll watch, we'll watch video. I'm a, um, you know, I need to, I need to see things. I need to have that image in my head. So I'm totally a visual uh, learner myself, and um, and certainly we ask that question of everybody within our program how the, how they learn best. Um, but we continue to hit, you know, all the forms. Um, you know, we show video. We give the scouting report, we go through the walkthrough, um, we follow up, we, we, we try and do everything to allow a player uh, to be in the best position to, to walk into a game. But pre-game, um, you know, there's a, a three-minute video um, that combines the, the things that we feel we need offensively and defensively, may have a few little hype moments to it. Um, but my, my team in New Zealand, in my first year over there, in I wanted a really strong evaluation. We, did, we didn't, you know, we'd come off three championships and then we missed the playoffs in my first year as a head coach. So, you know, I really wanted strong feedback about how I could do things better. And their feedback to me in pregame was, coach, you don't need to come up with a, a special motivation for every game. Um, all we, what we want from you is just give us the three most important things offensively, the three most important things defensively, and then how you see the game playing out is is what we want from you. And um, give us that in as concise information as you can, and um, and we'll challenge you if, if we think any of those um, are not where we want it to go. And so making sure that you not within a pregame talk that they're going to they're going to challenge those things. But through the week, you know, as you've expressed what you think is most important, that they've, they've challenged um, those components and get the three things, get the three things and, and let's go. Well, I love that. Again, there's been studies on this, and I think a lot of them have done, been done with Premier League soccer players. But just talking about debunking the myth of the pregame speech and, and just as you said, when you really ask players they don't think it's as valuable as, again, media, Hollywood, et cetera, would portray it as. Yeah, I think it's right. Now, that's certainly the feedback that I've had. And, you know, I grew up, with, um, you know, all kinds of different coaches. And, you know, as I look back on it, there's never really a moment, you know, that I thought, wow, that was that made me play so much better because of that talk. I'll remember the talk for, for different reasons for the story that they told, um, you know, for how they captured the moment um, and those kind of things rather than, um, you know, the, was I totally pumped up when I walked out of the room and just knew that we weren't going to lose. That, that didn't happen that often. Now, uh, some of this is resource based, obviously, the ability to have video uh, available pregame, et cetera. But uh, because you do have resource based, is the same philosophy applied at halftime where you want to show some video clips? Yeah, I've never really got there, you know, to yeah. a point that um, we've been good enough to capture the two or three clips that uh, we want to show. Um, we've often had coaches feed me, you know, three or four clips, so you know, kind of point to a coach during the game and say, I want to see that one. And um, as a coaching staff, just have a quick discussion about those before we go back and present to the team. Um, but yeah, with our half time and the, the walk time and um, the 15 minutes that you have, 
total before the game tips off again, um, we, we haven't been good enough to, to go and get to the point to show those three or four clips. Again, individually, we might grab a guy and say, just have a look at this one. Um, but yeah, we haven't got to the point. That, yeah, yeah, um, no, and that's it. Gets it. Yeah. <laughs> And that's the ideal world, obviously, that uh, a lot of us exist in, that we just can't do that. But so talk to me then about halftime in terms of let's start with first how you interact with your coaches to be able to get to the points that you want to be able to provide to your team. Sure, yeah. Um, obviously, I had a, a lead uh, defensive coordinator, coordinator you know, a lead on um, the offensive side and, and a lead on individual kind of components. So... You know, we have an office that's really close to our locker room. Uh, obviously, you've challenged in how you find that area on the road at different times. But at home games, you know, we have a great little office there. Um, and we also have, um, you know, our analysts as well uh, will we'll join those meetings. So, you know, it's just a really quick hit around the room. Tell me the most important thing, you know, moving forward. Um quick hit for me on the, on the stat sheet and our analyst just talking about, you know, are we hitting targets um, that we really thought were um, priority before the game? And then again, as we walk into the locker room, where we got to was, and again, taken from AFL, is that they have uh, line meetings. So the back line, the, the midfield, the, the forward line would have little meetings and some and coaches are certainly in those. But while we're having our meeting, we want to walk into um, the locker room and have them in discussion as when we walk in. And often, uh, so we'll just have our, um, our forwards and centers and our guards have a little meeting at halftime just to create conversation and try and solve some of those problems. So one of the first things where I walk into the locker room is, all right, what have you, what have you solved? Um, and get an answer from the guards and get an answer from the bigs. And then, all right, if, if, if they're the same things that we're speaking about as coaches, fantastic. Is there anything else um, that I need to add from the coaches meeting uh, to them? Or do we have a difference of opinion about how we move forward in, in some of those areas? Um, so, yeah, it all happens in, you know, three or four minutes in that, in that conversation. But I hated the point of when you walked into the locker room at halftime and there was silence. And that happened a couple of times over the last three years. And I was like, I just never want that point to happen again. I want whatever's going on in the game for our guys to continue to have conversations and, and problem solve. That's great. I love that detail. And thanks for sharing that. And uh, I'm wondering then uh, when you get to timeouts, it, it's it's got to be a faster process, but is the process similar that you want to have in terms of your interaction with your assistants, but also uh, you want your players to be engaged? Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't change. And I think we've been much better um, in that scenario of, of um, player led, you know, information before we get there. And I'm, I'm poor in getting to a timeout quickly. I'd like to hear the conversations of my assistant coaches and I'm often getting tapped on the shoulder by the referee to, to get out of a, a timeout. Um, but again, as I walk into that huddle, what are the two most important things that I need to tell the group? Um, how can I do it in the quickest manner? Um, sometimes my drawing skills fail me and I have to redo one of those. And so I take my time and, and make sure that there's, there's clarity as we as we move out of a timeout and you know this year it's going to be a little different as well you know we signed um you know baba yudai baba and um japanese and he's really working on his english but again we it's, it's, it's a good hit for us to say you know has baba totally understood what's happening in the heat of the moment um have we give him, given him absolute clarity with him being you know, slightly challenged with his with his language as well. So, um, the confirmation of what's been said at the timeout is going to have to be even clearer uh, coming out this year. Uh, it's interesting. That might actually slow you down and make you a little bit more specific with what you say to make sure that he understands, and it might make you better overall. Who knows? Well, I look forward to hearing your feedback on that at the end of the season, Coach. For sure. So, I'm wondering then. Uh, what philosophy you've had, and, and maybe some of this comes from some of the sports science out of Australia and the different things, but uh, getting your players back onto the court after halftime 
And, uh, you know, the traditional come back out and just run through a few lazy layups, et cetera. I mean, that's gone. So can you talk to me a little bit about what the philosophy is about getting them back and uh, getting some of the CNS activation and different things going? Support for the basketball podcast comes from Bet Online. Football is in full effect and the NBA is back. You might not be at a game this year, but you can still be in on the action at Bet Online. Bet Online is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on everything imaginable this season. From game spreads and totals to team, player, and coach props, Bet Online gives you more options to wager than any place online. Head to Bet Online today and use promo code ARMCHAIR to take advantage of all the great sign up bonuses. Bet Online, online sports experts use promo code ARMCHAIR, all in capitals. Listen up, fellows, because today we have a new Manscaped product alert. Manscaped just released the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. Take a look in the mirror and I guarantee you'll see hair sticking out of those holes. It's time to keep your ear and nose hair looking as nice as your clean-shaven pubes. Manscaped is forever changing the grooming game with their Weed Whacker. The Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer provides proprietary skin-safe technology, which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs, in those delicate holes. The premium Manscaped Weed Whacker uses a 9,000 RPM motor powered 360 degree rotary dual blade system. Its intelligently contoured design enhances the trimming experience and it is waterproof which makes for easy operation and cleaning. Look fellas, 79% of partners polled admitted that long nose hair is a major turnoff. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code armchair at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code armchair. What are you waiting for? Go whack your weed. Thank you, Manscaped, for keeping our pubes trimmed and hairs in our holes looking nice. Now back to the podcast. Our strength and conditioning coach, Nick Popovich, um, you know, does an amazing job in making sure that we're ready to go again. Um, our players, um, they differ. And I think some of them just need that. They just need to go see, you know, the ball go through the hole. Um, you know, Nick's going to give them the quick hit that they need uh, just to get back up to speed. But um, it's important for me to make sure that we're out there with, you know, four minutes kind of left on the clock at a minimum. Um, you know, we've had times where we've rushed and um, it hasn't had a good outcome. So, you know, I think just having that, Priority of time, and Nick keeps me on track in the in the um, halftime speech about what we get done there and the timing of it. And I can't let myself go over it because you know performance uh, can be um, affected if if I take too long. So um, yeah, I think the timing one's a massive issue. Nick does absolutely his thing with it, um, but then players having that extra minute just at the end to calm themselves get the clarity again um, before we go back out. Yeah, that's great. Great, great to hear that. And uh, what, what are some of the reasons you call timeouts, coach? Uh, for me, and, and I'm over my coaching career, I've had some really early ones. And, and I think, it, and most of the time, I think they've been really effective. And I think that's a gut feel for you to say, you know, we didn't, defend that first possession in the way that we just spoken about it in scouting um our pace of movement of the basketball is ineffective to try and create the shot that we want right now and and i think those two things and if it's just an individual to say he he got that wrong you can fix that with a sub or a, a, a word on from the sideline um but if you see the whole group you know and not holding themselves, if they made an error and they don't hold themselves, you know, to account and try and fix that problem in any way, then I'm, I'm happy to call it time out in the first minute of a quarter, a half, whenever it is that you think this one could hurt us um, for the next three possessions. Um, so, you know, that's a big one for me. You know, fatigue timeouts are, are real in our league you know, with the pace that it's played at. Um, with the amount of pressure in the full court that you can see. And if you want to keep um, what you consider, you know, your top line players on the floor, uh, it's important to do that. Um, we go 
subbing subbing system um, to make sure that. And then that always changes in the in the third and fourth quarter, anyways, about how people are going. Um, but again, if to me, um, if you need that time out to get the clarity down the stretch of the game, how cautious am I to make sure that early time out that I've still got some remaining that I need at the end of the game to ensure that um, if it comes down to it, I can give that last information on a, on a crucial, crucial defensive or offensive possession. Oh, good stuff. And uh, I'm curious then your experience as an assistant, and you've obviously worked with a ton of high level different coaches, but what, what are some of the things that you find most valuable from your assistants to be able to pass on to you in this short period of time for you to be able to communicate back to your team? Coverage is, you know, a lot and, and, you know, as you watch the game and as it slows down for you as a coach and, and you look at, um, are they, are they in multiple coverages on, you know, on, on different guys on the floor? Have they got a blanket kind of coverage in the, in the way that they're defending you? Um, you know, have we seen a, a new defense? There was, I think there was everyone explored some um, one three one and um, some different three two zones last year. And as we prepare ourselves, you know, for a season and a possible bubble at different times uh, at, you know, at the start of our season as well, we we think the zone is going to be a factor. Um, but you know, I think the discussions that we've had pre-game and through the week about, you know, variances of what we believe um, are the what ifs, you know, in a game, what might they do? Um, are we seeing those? Is the coverage um, on defense for us? Can we do it better or do we need to change? And I think they're what you want from your assistants to say, hey, let's give it one more go at trying to do it the way that we practiced or are we going to move to, to the next level of more or less aggressive? And I, I, I like that we're getting into this a little bit too about the information you're getting. You've talked about communication at the beginning. And then the other part that goes with this communication piece, uh, pregame, halftime, timeouts is also in game. So can you talk to me a little bit about your philosophy and maybe how it's changed or evolved over the years on in game communication to your players? Communicating to players while they're actually playing. Yeah, and, I, and I'm a talker. Certainly, I don't sit down very often. Um, I I kneel a lot, and my kneeling came from um, the want. And and Brett Brown was obviously one of one of my coaches early on um, as a player, and then got to work with him as a coach as well. And it's kind of like Brett, why do you why do you always kneel? And he's like, oh, so all the people behind me can see, and and I thought that well, yeah, that's exactly. I want to be as close to the game as I can, and so uh, I put myself in that position to you know walk in that coach's box and try and also be out of the way so all of my players have the have the vision and coaches have the vision of the game. At times I get in their way. But I'm going to continue to chatter, um, you know, to the, my players in a stoppage um, during the game. Um, continue to just give them, you know, reinforcement information about what I want from them. Um, and yeah, that's a constant for me. If I'm if I'm sitting down, um, mostly I think the game um, is comfortable, and and then I can just kind of relax and 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 chill out a little bit, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm an absolute communicator within game. It's, and it speaks to, you know, coaching to your personality, right? That's part of your personality that you, you feel that you wouldn't be who you were if you weren't chattering during the game. I, I'm curious then with that, have you ever asked your players for feedback on the things that you tell them during the game? And if what might be some of the best information that they find they get from you while play is going on? Yeah, I think you always, you know, follow up with those ones. And especially if there was any kind of debate at the time for them to, you know, to say, no, I think you know, I was thinking something different. And so I think you, you've got to go back and make sure there's, um, you know, there's no uh, animosity to, to the way it was presented or um, what was said. 
and to make sure you're absolutely aligned. And I think as you, as you get older in coaching, those relationships just become so much more important and you go ahead and have those tough conversations afterwards um, about what happened in, in the heat of battle. And so I really enjoy that in the, and then the review of a game. And when I do go back and watch a game, obviously, you know, we get so much footage that's cut up now that's only just what's going on on the court. It's really important to me to go back and watch the game in its entirety so that you see what's happening when the when the game's not being played. You see body language. You see um, how you communicated or what the reaction was. And so, again, you can see more at, in the review sometimes or reinforce what you, you thought happened in the game. You know, just by going back and watching those moments and so I'll certainly cut up edits to show the whole group um, you know if that refers to any part of our trademark what actually happened when the when the battle wasn't going on when there was when there was the quiet moments. I'm curious do you find yourself uh, talking in game about defense more than offense or offense more than defense or is it both? Yeah uh, certainly you know the defensive talk is is an absolute constant, you know, even uh, in those quick stoppages. And, um, you know, there's, there's kind of 16, 17 stoppages there that um, with free throws and different things that, that I think you have a chance to to bring a, your point guard over or a player over and, and have a, you know, a good, you know, 15 or 20 second kind of conversation as well. So, um, you know, what's, what's relevant to... To the next play, um, was there something that happened defensively that that we need to change? Is there information that I'm feeding for what might happen in the future to say, hey, if we get this next stop in our coverage, maybe we're going to a switching defense for the next minute after that uh, to take away the three. And so, you know, just predicting some of the things that might happen forward as much as um, picking the next element offensively or defensively. The, the next logical question that is to talk about officials and uh, how uh, how this communication happens uh, with officials and what's some of the best practices that you've learned if you talk to officials at all during the game. Yeah, and I do it too much. And I, um, you know, my coaching staff is is good at knowing when I'm going a little bit over the top and and just grabbing me and um, you know bringing me back to making sure I'm, I'm focusing on the game and, and not on the officials. Um, our officials in Australia are, are pretty good in um, allowing, you know, some of the conversations that we have. And and some of you know, our officials in the past and not so much the, the newer referees that we see now are very good at um, deflating some of the situations as well um, by saying, hey, I might have got that one wrong. And, you know, every now and again, you just want to hear that, that they're, that, they're, that they're human and that they, they make mistakes as well. And um, I think when you, when you hear that, you know, you don't have much of a comeback. And it just, it's like, oh, move on. That's the, they've admitted they might not have seen that one. Um, but when, you know, whenever they uh, talk about, uh, you know, that's not my position or, you know, something that you're like, well, you guys have got to be a team when you, when you feel like they're not operating as a team. And then, um, then I think, you, you know, I get a little more heated to say that they, they don't have each other's back on, on everything. So um, what does it, does it help you? Does it, does it, I think you got to fight for your players at different times. I think it's important that they feel um, supported when they might feel an injustice on the court, that, that you've gone to bat for them. And, um, you know, I rarely have had technical fouls. So somewhere over my course of time, I've found a, a balance to get a few warnings every now and again, but to not step over the line, um, that will hurt, hurt our team. Well, I couldn't agree more about when an official at, at any point, their easiest way to defuse the situation is to somehow indicate that they're human. 
<laughs> it's just, it just simply is so useful to be able to add that perspective to it uh, for us as coaches, because again, we sometimes think our players should be perfect. We sometimes think officials should be perfect too. Yeah, I can't agree more. Um, we all make mistakes. And as a coach, we, we continually make, make our own mistakes as well. So um, yeah, just hearing that element just puts it back, you know, back to you to like, yep, everybody makes mistakes. No question. No question. And then I'm curious with your time out philosophy then or how you would approach foul trouble. And, uh, you know, coaches are fully aware that you play different rules than say the NBA or, uh, you know, NCAA college basketball, but can you talk about how you handle foul trouble then relative to in-game coaching? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. Like I, I, players have got me at different times to say, you know, coach, trust me, trust me, leave me out there, leave me out there. And I think, you know, during um, practice games that we've got coming up, um, you know, we need, and you need to find out what new players are capable of as well. You know, it's not something that you always dig into when you're scouting someone is how they, how they deal with foul trouble. You know, you might, luckily come across some games and look at their um you know their average fouls per game and it's like oh he's in the he's in the three plus per game you know what's he do how's he handle it did he um you know did he get purposeful minutes when he when he was in foul trouble or did he um allow people to you know blow by him or not defend with physicality that that was required so i think that's a, a total learning and um, something that I like to ask players as well, you know, just tell, tell me, tell me honestly, um, if you, you pick up three fouls in the first half, what, what are we going to do with you in the, in the third quarter? And when do we, when do we bring you back? Um, you know, but again, you have to have, you have to, it has to be that element that you've tried to really trust that they can play the right way, you know, with foul trouble. Um, you know, as those games get more important at the end of the year, um, I think, you know, you're a little bit more on the cautious side to, to ensure um, that that player doesn't foul out. And sometimes it's out of their control as well, um, judging on how the game's being called. Um, do I risk it today with, with the way that um, the, re the referees are blowing the game? Love hearing that. Love hearing these perspectives on it. Coach, I understand you, you have three kids that are involved in youth basketball and youth sports. So I'm just curious now, kind of going back uh, in your mind to coaching those age levels and what are some of the things you may do the same or maybe do differently in terms of some of these in-game approaches that we've talked about? Yeah, sure. The, I loved coaching under 12s. That was my, my as a coaching director, um, as I moved in different pro jobs, um, taking an under 12 group was the funnest job um, that I had. And I love that age group because you really are, you know, just teaching um, motion offense. You, you've, you're limited in the amount of screens uh, that you set. And I mean, I look at our practice the other day and it was an edit that came up and we were in a, a simple five out motion um, that we would use in under 12s and, and it got us a really effective shot. And I said it, I was like, oh, look at this. You know, the game turns around from where you learn it at 12s to get to a point where, you know, spacing and, and simple movement is is so important. So on the, on the tactical side of it, um, you know, I, I'd really go back and you know, and simplify the game and really make sure that skill level um, is the most important thing in, in the shots that we create and, and, and how, you know, we come together in, in trying to multi-skill uh, talent. When you talk about, you know, timeouts and, um, you know, the communication and how we, how we do that at a junior level, you know, not a lot of change other than probably my tone um, you know, and certainly wouldn't challenge the referees uh, like I would at, in, at the pro level. But, you know, just the information, that how positive, you know, I would be in a timeout, how positive I would be in my, in my talk along the sideline. And I think, 
that's a challenge for me, even at the pro level. How how can I turn the the message that I want uh, into being a, a real positive for our group and not not focusing on you know what we can always improve on, making sure that there's a real balance in the message. Yeah, that's great. It's great to hear, uh, you know, a coach's perspective that obviously is coached at all the different levels and coached in a lot of different ways and uh, to be able to kind of connect it back to some of those younger levels. So I thank you for doing that. Uh, coach, maybe just to wrap up another quote that I've heard you talk about and uh, maybe I'll paraphrase it, but uh, the biggest difference in years where you succeeded versus failed to reach expectations is the quality of relationships. Can you talk to me about that and the importance of the relationships and maybe how you do that? Yeah, I think it's, it's obviously you've got to you've got to create a bond um, with everyone on your team. Uh, but the years that I've written on my practice plan, I need to talk to these three or four guys today, and how good you know you can be in making sure that you've get got to everybody. I had a conversation with a player yesterday, um, a rookie on our team, and one of the things that he expressed to me it's like oh we we really haven't spoken for a, for a week and a half or two weeks about my game and i was disappointed in myself in that one uh, he returned from injury he got a couple of weeks and i just kind of felt like I'm, i'll just let him get back into the flow of things and then we'll we'll have those conversations but he wanted um more feedback than than i'd given over the last two weeks and so you know that's just a constant reminder that there's probably a lot of people on your group that are feeling like that if if you're not making effort um to make sure that you communicate with everybody on that individual basis and so um sometimes again is it that hard conversation that's stopping you from from going to talk to the person um, you know, is it right to do it in the practice environment with COVID right now? It's just been harder to, to really, um, you know, have those one-on-one -on -one conversations at a cafe or different spots. So, um, so most of the time those, those communications have to be on court right now, um, before, after practice in, in the times that you've got. And so, um, we had a little less in our coaching staff for a little while and I was heavily involved in the player development side our coaching staff has built back to a point where I can really get around and watch everybody in their individual workouts and then grab a guy, sit down, talk about some of the things that I see uh, in his workouts and how that relates to the game. And so I've allowed myself a little bit more time to get to everybody. But, you know, you know when you do it and, you, and, you, and you're doing it well, um, just the response that you get when you have to have the real tough conversations in game that that relationship is strong enough to challenge and move on really quickly um, or just take the instruction and fly with it. That's great. And uh, coach, I cannot thank you enough for sharing the game with us. Uh, communication, culture, trademarks, and how coaches impact the game in real time. Just tremendous stuff. So thank you for taking the time. No problem. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and to give the Basketball Podcast and this week's guest a shout out on social media to show your support for us sharing the game. And to stay up to date on all things Basketball Immersion, subscribe to our newsletter at basketballimmersion.com newsletter.